It's Sunday, December 4, 2022. Welcome to the 42nd episode in this series from Midas Touch and 5-Minute News called The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. Subscribe to this show as audio in addition to my daily 5-Minute News podcast on iTunes or wherever you get yours. Joining me today is Dr. Jennifer Machia, a historian of American political rhetoric, professor in the Department of Communication and Journalism at Texas A&M University, and author of the book Demagogue for President, the Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. Jennifer, welcome to The Weekend Show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, the title of your book, I know, kind of gets people excited for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> to put Trump and genius in the same sentence obviously concerns people. Um, but the word rhetorical is kind of the magic word there, isn't it? And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Um, we're going to look this week at what has kept Donald Trump in the news, uh, which includes the removal of the special master overseeing the seized documents, the Alan Weiselberg tax fraud case at the Trump Organization, and uh, also Trump's association with Kanye West and uh, Nick Fuentes and the far right generally. Uh, he's never out of the newspapers, Trump, but this week it's um, for very many reasons. Uh, but first, I just want to spend a very quick minute telling you about our new sponsor, Hover. Have you ever thought about starting your own business, creating a brand, sharing your wealth of knowledge with the world? using your years of experience to create something for yourself. Well, Hover wants to help you take the first step in getting your ideas off the ground. If you have a brand that you've always dreamt of building or a business that you want to take online, the first step is finding your domain name. Hover makes this super simple with clear and straightforward user experience, easy to use tools and truly amazing support from friendly humans. It's never too late to step up to the plate and share what you have to offer. Getting online has helped thousands of people around the world reach new heights with their businesses. In addition to the classics like .com, you can get extensions like .shop or .tech and .art with over 400 more to choose from. You'll be able to find the perfect domain name for your business, one that's memorable, relevant and boosts your brand. You can buy a domain, set up custom email boxes and point it to your website in just a few clicks. And if you ever run into trouble, help is just a phone call or chat away. Secure, simple and reliable, Hover is a trusted and popular choice among millions of people launching any kind of brand or business. Well, if you're ready to get your idea off the ground with the perfect domain name, head to hover.com slash weekend to get 10% off your first Hover purchase. I'm with Dr. Jennifer Machia. Um, Jennifer, tell us just very quickly why you felt the need to write the, the book Demagogue for President. I wanted to explain how Donald Trump essentially attacked the United States during his 2016 presidential campaign. He took a nation that was experiencing crisis levels of distrust and polarization and frustration. And he used rhetorical strategies that were designed to increase all of those negative qualities in the electorate, um, essentially attacking the nation by doing that. And so I wanted to explain how that worked um, so that people could see what I could see as a rhetoric scholar and uh, decide what they thought about it. And I mean, he's all about rhetoric, isn't he? I mean, yes. that's that's his thing. And whether it be in uh, the buzz phrases, catchphrases, repetition. He he has, I mean, he kind of is a genius, isn't he, for all the wrong reasons? He is. And it is controversial, the title of the book. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I use that is a little bit tongue in cheek, right? He calls himself a genius. Uh, so it's actually in the index, you know, how many times he calls himself a genius in the book. Um, but also more seriously, when a rhetorical scholar named Kenneth Burke wrote a book review of Mein Kampf in 1939, he wrote about what he described as Hitler's demagogic effectiveness, uh, right? So all of the ways in which you could see this rhetorical genius in Mein Kampf, as dangerous as it was, um, in order to expose it. And so calling him a rhetorical genius is sort of like an updated uh, version of <laughs> demagogic effectiveness, I'm sure there will be some Trump fans who have inadvertently bought the book, <laughs> thinking that it is a celebration of the, the of Trump's greatest hits. 
Do you think that might be the case? Yeah, there's a couple of reviews on Amazon where it's very clear that they bought the book thinking that it was a demigod, demigod, yeah. not a demigod, demigod yeah. <laughs> not not realizing that I wasn't calling him, you know, heroic in that way. I just want to get your perspective on something that I think about a lot, and that is, you know, I was born and brought up in the UK and was there for, for 40 years. And the way that our media and our TV news and our newspapers operate is very different to the US. And I arrived in the US two weeks before Trump's inauguration. So I, I, only, re I only had a two weeks of, of Barack Obama's uh, presidency. And so I was driven to create Five Minute News because the way that Trump was being reported by US media the way that cable news was using him to kind of build audience and, and the newspapers just enjoyed his, you know, they didn't take seriously their responsibility as newscasters and, and news gatherers. The, the public service aspect of covering Donald Trump, they were all completely negligent. Um, do you feel the same way? Do you feel that the US really kind of put Trump on a pedestal because of the commercial nature of its news gathering? Yeah, definitely mistakes have been made. Um, one of those mistakes is, you know, during the lull of the long presidential campaign, because they're far too long, um, you know, they just stuck a camera in front of Trump and allowed him to go on the air. You know, they covered his rallies. They did things that they would never do for another presidential candidate. They let him phone in to multiple Sunday shows from his bedroom. Um, you know, they just wouldn't do that for anyone else. But he drew ratings. And so they were willing to do that. So that's one mistake that they made. Then another one, um, I think, is a little bit more understandable. Um, it, it's hard to believe that somebody like Donald Trump is actually the threat that Donald Trump is. You know, I think a lot of people... Because of the jokey nature of his... The joking rhetoric. nature of it. Just the whole, you know, in America, we're not used to thinking of our government as fragile. We're not used to thinking of, you know, our democracy as something that we need to work to preserve and protect every day. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, when they voted for him, they thought that the office would change him. They thought that he would become presidential, that it was all kind of an act. Um, and, you know, even myself, I had been studying him um, and his language since, you know, really the summer of 2015 when he started, um, but but very seriously studying his demagoguery um, since like late November of 2015. And even though I had been writing about it and talking about it um, and was, you know, working on this book. I still asked myself almost every day if it was real, you know, if even while like things that I was predicting he would do came true, I still was trying to talk myself out of it. Like I didn't really believe it. Um, and, and, and still to this day, I mean, when I look at what happened with the recreation of the January 6th events, right. From the January 6th committee report, um, you know, it's still hard to believe that there was a president sitting in the White House for three hours doing nothing while the nation was being attacked. Um, you know, and but I he, know he, he did, did nothing it. every day, though. Didn't <laughs> he he? I mean, he didn't really <laughs> president at all. <laughs> he, he and so that, to him, that was just another day of doing nothing and watching TV in the dining room. Well, but under very different circumstances. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't sure. <laughs> There was no other time when the Capitol was being attacked. So, um, yeah, I mean, I really did struggle. And, and I rewrote my conclusion several times, you know, and ultimately I just decided that it didn't matter if he was pretending to be an authoritarian or if he was actually a authoritarian because pretending to be an authoritarian is authoritarian. Right. Um, pretending to be one means that people are thinking of you that way and there's still it still has the same effect. Um, and so I decided that that he was an authoritarian, but I really wasn't sure until he showed me that he was. But January 6 was entirely predictable, wasn't it? I mean, there was <laughs> many people who were saying, you know, this is what how this is going to end. 
Uh, and I was one of those people, but I still right. didn't believe it. <laughs> is what I'm saying. And, and, and me, and me too. But I, I recognize that it's almost as if in the U.S. and this is the difference with my experience in in Europe. It's like you need children to to be slaughtered in a school for something to happen. That's how it would normally happen in Europe. Anyway, it's what happened in the U.K. with the the solitary school shooting. But in the U.S., like these huge events, they don't really change things. And and despite all of the effort to kind of reposition the, the statute book so that this never happens again, there's a very good chance that January 6th was just the rehearsal. And Trump, to all intents and purposes, is gearing up for another run, another attempt to steal the election, uh, because it's highly unlikely he could win legitimately, and another attack on democracy. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. Um, And what we see from the Republican Party uh, certainly doesn't give confidence that they're going to do anything to prevent it. Um, You know, if you look at political science research, they'll say that, you know, the way to prevent a demagogue or a fascist or an authoritarian from taking power is through the party system, that the party elite would make sure that you know, they sort of police their own, that they would make sure that no one like Donald Trump would ever get close to becoming president. Um, but Donald Trump, you know, he demagogued them first, right? He mastered them. He bullied them. He used weaponized communication strategies against them first. And then from there, the rest of the nation. Um, and he just exposed their weaknesses. He's someone who looks for vulnerabilities to exploit and is very good at exploiting them. Do you think Republicans realize that the effort that you go to and you went to in writing this book and the thoughts that you have about this subject every day and with me as well are not because we are snowflake Democrats? I mean, I'm not a Democrat, but I mean, it's because we care about the health of the country, whoever is in power. And, the, you know, I always say I, I, I believe in strong opposition in politics. And, and there is no opposition here. It's enemies. It's, it's the goodies and baddies. Uh, do, you th- do you think MAGA Republicans understand that we are here and having this conversation because we care about them and their future? They think this is just us yet again, just criticizing Trump and blaming Trump. I mean, is there enough thought about the, the the fragility of democracy? I think it's hard to characterize, you know, all of the Republican Party um, as, as one way or another. I have, I'm surrounded by Republicans where I live in Texas. And so um, I'm at home, literally my neighbors across the street, they voted for Trump in 2016 and didn't vote for him in 2020. My neighbors next door, voted for him both times. Um, You know, they all read my book. (laughs) They understand that I'm, you know, very much invested in democracy. Um, And, and, you know, for myself, at least, perhaps uniquely so, you know, I wrote, my first book was about um, the early American Republic and what it meant to have a government based on the will of the people and why the founders were afraid of the people. And, and so um, it was about the difference between a republic and a democracy. And, uh, you know, I know the history of this nation very well and the political theory. And I know that I am um, uniquely trusting of the will of the people. Um, I'm more democratic than most people or political theorists would say would be prudent. Um, but their argument at the moment is that it's not a democracy and it never right. was. They say it's a... a uh, what do they call it? A constitutional republic. That's right. They're well, not wrong. <laughs> they're not wrong. <laughs> they're but not wrong. It's it's also a democracy. It, it's operated on the democratic system since forever. I mean, you tell me because I'm not the expert, but yeah, I mean, so it is possible to be both, right? It It is. So it's fascinating, actually. The founding generation did not use the word democracy. They did not consider the democratic form of government um, for this nation. And when they thought about forming a republic, it was um, to them the apotheosis of enlightenment rationality, right? It, you know, as, as in terms of political theory. Um, and it was radical at the time, right? So they formed a government based on the will of the people, but they 
wanted to separate the people and their dangerous opinions from political power as much as possible. So one of the metaphors that they used repeatedly at the Constitutional Convention was that it would be a federal pyramid and that um, power would be located at the top or the tip of the pyramid and that the people would be at the bottom forming the base, but also as far away from power, actual power as possible. Um, but then, you know, if you look at just the very beginning of the nation, the first um, Senate where they were debating um, what became the Bill of Rights, uh, one of the things that they asked to include in what became the First Amendment to the Constitution was, um, in addition to, you know, the right to free speech and assembly and petition and all that, is that we should have the right to instruct our representatives so that we would give them binding instructions and they would have to do what we wanted. So they would essentially be our proxy in Congress. And, um, of course, Congress was supposed to be the center of power. It wasn't supposed to be the presidency. Um, and that certainly changed over time. Um, but so, you know, in that debate, which is the most contentious debate over any part of what became the Bill of Rights, um, they had a debate over whether it was a democracy and the people should have the right to instruct their representatives or not. And James Madison said, right, the author of the Constitution, he said, if the people want to change the Constitution, that's their right. But while the Constitution exists, they must conform themselves to its dictates. And he said that if you think that we have formed a democracy, you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I um, mean, this will come home to roost, really, won't it? Because, yeah. you know, as Republicans gain power, I mean, obviously, the, the, the jury is still out. And, and, and you and I, as we're recording this, don't know the result of the, the Georgia runoff, which is going to obviously affect the, the, the balance of power in the Senate. But, um, you know, Kevin McCarthy who is the uh, hoping to be the speaker and is you know the kind of unofficially or officially the leader of the Republicans in Congress i mean he was complicit in the entire insurrection effectively he is not somebody who has uh, backed down at all in on his position he just famously says nothing or just you know uses a word salad just to give the press something but says nothing i mean it's not as if these are fringe characters that are anti-democratic. These are the actual leaders in well, on the hill, effectively. Yeah, um, and I think McCarthy is um, perversely ambitious. Uh, and being yeah. accused of being ambitious in the early republic was the worst insult you could be. It meant you were unfit for office. Uh, because you were you were in a quest for power more in more than you were about serving the public, and um, that he does seem to be a person who is unusually ambitious to become the Speaker of the House. I can tell when he's acting. I'm sure you can. He's really not a very good actor, but I watch him f faking outrage. Yeah, and he announced last week. It might be at the beginning of this week, that the first thing that the Republicans are going to do in Congress is read the Constitution aloud. <laughs> I mean, if I, I'm sure there will be MAGA Republicans going, yes, Kevin, you know, <laughs> finally, someone who's taking us back to our roots. What's the real reason for that type of rhetoric? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a stunt. Um, I you know, I think that um, that that he probably would choose to support some parts of the Constitution over others, and he's not maybe thinking about all of it, <laughs> um, right? There, there were real reasons why Donald Trump was impeached. Um, he violated his oath of office, and that's right there in the first part of the Constitution. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what he hopes to achieve with that, but uh, I don't think it's that, the picking and choosing. Of it's the, the law, picking and it? choosing. That's, that's what I find so comical. It's like, well, in one breath, you're criticizing Democrats for this, you know, whether it be mask wearing, for example, you know, saying you're taking away people's rights. And in the next breath, they're kind of blaming the other side for, for not handling COVID properly. I mean, it's like you can't have both. That's right. 
Um, outrage bait is a great way to get attention and engagement, which is the coin of the realm in today's public sphere. Um, and so, you know, it's something that Donald Trump has used to his advantage. And I think that those folks who support him in the Republican Party have learned to use um, almost as well as he has. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of that this week with Kanye West, um, <laughs> sort of using a lot of Trumpian strategies to attract a lot of attention and um, create a lot of outrage and, and really, you know, sort of taking the spotlight away from Trump. Let's talk about Kanye West or Ye, as he wants to be called now, for a moment, because he got banned from Twitter or suspended from Twitter a couple of days ago for um, posting a, a swastika and a Star of David together. Uh, the the ultimate, you know, the, the the symbol of the Nazis, the symbol of the Jews, kind of combined. I mean, he's not hiding his prejudice, is he? And and he's been absolutely clear in so many of his communique of late. And I actually believe he's severely mentally ill, mentally impaired. And he actually spoke in an interview a little while ago. Uh, he blamed a Jewish doctor for diagnosing him with something and trying to medicate him. And he was refusing because, of course, it's not true. Well, I don't know what the details were, but I'm guessing the, the, the doctor was like, you are, you know, maybe he needed to give him lithium or something. I mean, who only knows? But he is imbalanced. And tragically, Trump aligning himself, even by having dinner at Mar-a-Lago with him, is sending a signal. It's a, it's a smoke signal to the extremists and to the far right and to the the kind of characters that, that democracy most fears. Yeah, absolutely. So the same day that Kanye West was banned from Twitter, Twitter um, reestablished the account of um, white supremacist, neo-Nazi Andrew, Andrew Anglin from Daily Stormer um, and who supports Kanye West. Um, and there's a real rift right now on the right extremist fringe of the Republican Party. So there's, um, you know, sort of the Christian nationalist wing, and Donald Trump has been its avatar for the last five years. Um, and you see a group of people, Kanye West among them, Nick Fuentes, um, Andrew Anglin, maybe um, Alex Jones, unclear if he's just a stooge, um, who are trying to wrest power away from what they see as Trump and his corporate allies. And, you know, these are these are parts of the Republican Party that agree on almost every single thing. Um, they have one major difference, and that's uh, their orientation towards Jewish people. Why is anti-Semitism on the rise in the way that it is? Why do you think that these characters, including Donald Trump, who has said some horrific things. I mean, even addressing a, a Jewish uh, event one time, you know, and he said, you know, I'm lowering your taxes and I know that that's what you really want. And it was like, really? Like, are you saying this stuff out loud? Yeah. I mean, why now? You know, why is, is anti-Semitism so much on the rise? Yeah, so I think there's always anti-Semitism um, in the United States. In, in the Western tradition, there's always been anti-Semitism. I think that there are times when it's sort of called into being um, and made more prominent in not only the United States, but in other places around the world, obviously. Um, Donald Trump was someone in 2015 who... Um, had attracted the support and the attention, of course, of the white nationalist community. They debated whether or not they thought he was one of them. And um, they ended up deciding that because he was on the right side of what they called the nationalist question, that he was the only one worth supporting, you know, of the 17 or whatever uh, primary candidates. Um, and he they were thrilled with this campaign. Um, you know, they they did meme warfare for him, information warfare. They doxed people. They threatened people. Um, they were very much a part of his 2016, 2016 campaign, feeding him information, memes, content, all that stuff. Um, and then they got disappointed because he didn't go far enough. 
right? So, you know, he, he wants to use the rhetorical strategy of paralypsis. The, the, I'm not saying, I'm just saying he wants to have it both ways to allow himself to have plausible deniability about his racism. Um, and it's like mafia language. Isn't yeah, it? You exactly. Know, you, don't, you don't commit to anything. Yeah. You, it's, it's and, racism. And, and so with no a one wink. can pin anything on you. <laughs> That's right. Racism with a wink and the racists yeah. want, you know, real racism. They want it to be overt. And that really, I think, is the main difference in this Christian nationalist, you know, sort of warfare that's that's emerging right now um, about 2024. And it's way too early to be talking about 2024. But, um, you know, they seem to want to sort this out now. I don't know how many candidates, you know, the nation can handle um, on the right wing fringe that are pushing Christian nationalist and, um, you know, this kind of racist identity. But um, but yeah, they seem to really want to figure out which one is going to be the champion in the ring. In, in 2016, a lot of Jewish people voted for Trump. There was a quite a large support for, for him. Um, I, I have never really got to the bottom of that because, you know, to me, there was enough information out there about Trump and just general xenophobia. You know, and I think any minority group should recognize, and that's why I don't understand why there are any black people that support Trump either, you know, or or even Mexicans who, according to him, are all rapists and criminals. Yet there is a huge Latino vote for Trump as well. There is this middle ground, isn't there, where even minority groups will have a, a xenophobic attitude towards others and therefore side with the demigod. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there are authoritarian personalities in both political parties and in all racial um, demographics. And Trump ran a campaign that was designed to appeal to authoritarians, uh, people who wanted a strong leader, people who were worried about violence, that were worried about being attacked. You know, the nation is pure and these invaders are coming to get us. Um, and, you know, when he positioned his followers as um, you know, American exceptionalism personified as the greatest part of America. That's enticing for people, um, including people who are new to this country. My dad's an immigrant and he's a Trump supporter. And, you know, he watches Fox News and OAN and Newsmax. And he hears that he is a good American, you know, from watching those a programs. Patriot. Yeah, he's yeah. a patriot. And yeah. that resonates with him. And I think it resonates with a lot of people. Let's talk about this kind of fake alternative reality that, that your dad and, and Trump supporters and Donald Trump live in. Yeah. And I tried to get to the bottom of this last week. Um, and I, I don't know if I succeeded necessarily. I mean, I always do my best. I was talking to Republican uh, former Congressman Joe Walsh last week, uh, who's kind of flipped, you know, but still claims to be a, a, a Tea Party guy. You know? And that is that there, is, there are two Americas and they, and they run in parallel. There may be three or four, but certainly in the mainstream there are there are two. And the one that Trump and the all of these characters, these extremists and right wing and far right and Christian nationalist and goodness only knows what groups because he's <laughs> kind of gone for anybody who's like not not a liberal. Anyone um, who likes him. <laughs> anyone anyone who smiles at him, basically, right. yeah. Who it, it fuels that fuels the narcissist. Um None of what they are campaigning on or what they're talking about at the dinner table or what Fox is broadcasting, none of it is true. Not even like a little bit of it, you know, whether it be the southern border, which is a whole thing and complaining that, you know, Biden's never been there or Harris has never been there. And that becomes the problem, not the fact that they've turned away more people in the last couple of years than ever before or that they now have technology to deal with it and Mexico is actually paying for it. That whole rhetoric is fake, right? And 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 any issue that we could raise now and talk about, whether it be mandatory COVID vaccinations or any of these things, when you dig into the weeds of any of these things that they are campaigning on and they are talking about, they are not true. So you have a, a half the voting population are living in this false reality. I mean, that is very unhealthy because you could literally say anything and they'll 
by it. They don't care for proof or facts or even if it's right in front of their face. They still will side with Trump or whoever is talking in this way. Yeah, absolutely. Most Americans are not consuming the news on a daily basis. In fact, most Americans are actively avoiding the news as much as possible. Um, they might get some news and information in ambient ways. Um, they probably still vote because voting has really increased. But something like 67% of the nation is actively avoiding the news. And only 15 to 20% of the nation is very engaged with the news. Um, and these are people who subscribe to news services. They watch, they read the morning headlines. They probably talk about the news with their friends and family, maybe online. Um, you know, they're very committed. They're political true fans. And so there's a really fascinating analysis, uh, a book called The Other Divide, and it explains that the real division in this country isn't between uh, Republicans and Democrats, though it is, absolutely. Um, but it's really between these people who are highly engaged and very partisan and very polarized and everyone else who doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Because folks like us sound insane. Uh, when I talk to my students in political communication class and in propaganda class, where you would think that they would be high consumers of political news and information, they are not. They only get information from TikTok. When I talk to them about what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, they look at me like I am a crazy person. <laughs> well, you're, you're radical. I'm just telling them like the, the, the most basic facts about the stories that are in the news. And to them, it is so absurd. And, and I think if you try to talk to folks who aren't in the news bubble about news, um, you'll, you'll find the same thing. But so the effect of having these political true fans be the ones that are the most engaged in news and everybody else avoiding it means that those of us who, who really do consume this news information, we're going to seek out that information that confirms our biases, right? That's how people think. That's how partisanship works and polarization. And so on the one hand, you know, you have... Fox News viewers who have been radicalized by Fox, um, and I've seen that happen with my dad over time. But at the same time, those viewers are now so radicalized that, for example, when Fox called the 2020 election for Donald Trump, they all turned off the channel and said, there are liars now, right? Joe Biden. Yeah, because Joe Biden can't possibly be president. And so yeah. then they had to sort of recant and be like, well, we don't know now. But we've heard that from Carrie Lake. Like, she yes. cannot believe yes. that the people of Arizona would not vote for her because yes. when she goes on her walkabouts or goes to tea parties or makes speeches, she is surrounded by sycophants. And yes. so they assume that the whole world or the whole state is is that. And is that the effect of this divide between the parties is that you will never engage with the opposition, so therefore you don't think they exist. That's right. Um, you know, it's a very interesting thing when Donald Trump essentializes his followers as the best of America, because that tells them that only their votes matter, right? So it doesn't matter who anyone else voted for if they voted for anyone other than Trump, because those people aren't real people. They're not the best of America. They're not even real Americans. So... It doesn't matter if there's more of those people or not, um, because Trump supporters know that they are the only ones that count. And so only their votes should count. But this is so multi-threaded, isn't it? Because it really is. they don't count because they, their votes count, but they don't count because he doesn't care about them. They are not his people. They are not the people that would buy memberships to Mar-a-Lago. They are not the people that would hang out with him and Jeffrey Epstein having a, you know, a, a, a party with a bunch of girls. I mean, that's the world that he inhabits, you know, being treated well by the Saudis or the Russians and, and borrowing money and operating at very high levels. He's, he's never been to a trailer park in his life. No. And so the, the, the multi-threading of this is that he is, has convinced them that he loves them. Yes. And he com has convinced them that they will be safe and he's looking out for them. Yes. When he is doing no such thing. Yes. And and for you as an <laughs> educator trying to explain this to people that have been radicalized by TikTok, 
is another layer to this to this hyper threading of insanity. Yeah, it's a tough job sometimes um, <laughs> to <laughs> teach what I teach, where I teach To it. say the very least. Yes. Um, you know, it is. It's fascinating because a demagogue has no power if they have no supporters. And so Donald Trump yeah. has been very careful to cultivate his followers. He never insults them. He always praises them. They're the smartest. They're the best. Um, he tells them he loves them repeatedly over and over and over again, has always done even, so. Even when they're trying to break down the windows and the doors of the U.S. Capitol building. That's right. We love you. You're very special. I yes. mean, that is, I mean, it's unbelievable. No, that, but there's a whole other part of it, which is yeah. that it's fascist because he right. tells them at the same time that he's protecting them, that in fact, he's the only thing that stands between those people that hate them and that are out to get them and, you know, their fate, right? He's the only one who's willing to defend them and he loves them. And so because he loves them and because he suffers for them, they owe him. They owe him their loyalty. They owe him their vote. They owe him their money. Uh, you know, whatever it is, they owe it to him. Um, and so it's a very fascist relationship um, where, unfortunately, he's using them because, as you say, he, he actually despises them. I mean, it's sort of ironic that someone who needs to be adored as much as Donald Trump does um, you know, is adored by these people who he despises. I've always been interested in how Republicans and the people who are responsible for the Republican message, namely Fox and, and similar cable news channels, tell viewers what to think. So instead of presenting the news, they tell them what they should be thinking. You should be outraged. Isn't it crazy that this is happening? And, like, this is not news. I mean, this is not newscasting or, or journalism. This is, this is entertainment. But it's entertainment that is very dangerous. It's tinged with, with danger because it has added to this great divide and this hatred. And, and the effect is that eventually people get killed because hate crime is on the rise and it's directly linked to this kind of rhetoric. And yet... Democrats would never seek to tell their supporters what to think. They'll just present what is on the cards or what, you know, or, or they'll listen and, and try and do right by their followers. No, that's not exactly true. Tell so, me. yeah. <laughs> so media scholars have been studying media effects, um, particularly on this question since the 1960s, um, probably even before that. Um, and the agenda setting function of the mass media is well established. And what you see is we have an agenda setting war that has developed in the United States um, ever since you had more than three you know, news channels, ever since cable came. And, and of course, even before that, really, with talk radio, um, you know, you had people that were trying, at least in some way, on a fringe level to combat the agenda setting power of the mass media. Um, so Noam Chomsky is not wrong when he says that, you know, the news media is manufacturing consent, that they are telling the nation what are the important stories. We are all vulnerable. You know, those of us sitting, you know, in Texas, probably more so than someone like you in L.A., but we're all vulnerable to that because we don't have direct firsthand experience. We're not in Washington, D.C. We're not in these meetings. We don't really know what's going on. Um, we know what they tell us is going on. And so we're all vulnerable to that. Um, the traditional news media is much more likely to present facts in a neutral way. They're more likely to um, use institutional sources, right? So they'll go to experts, they'll go to people who are in the government um, and ask their opinions or their statements. Whereas um, the other side, I don't know what you want to call it, the right wing fringe or or whatever, the Fox News Max uh, ecosystem, they are much more likely to add outrage to their news coverage. They're not breaking news, so they're not reporters necessarily. They're more opinion havers. Um, and so that can be very confusing. And what they do um, in that outrage news media is, um, you know, they, they hijack their audience's amygdala. So they make it very difficult 
for them to think rationally and critically about the information that they're provided. Um, they use fear appeals, they use conspiracy theory, they use outrage, they use all of these disgust, um, like all of these strategies that social scientists and cognitive scientists um, and political psychologists know are very um, activating, right? So they make you pay attention, um, they activate your frustration, uh, and and in so doing, you want to find out what should I be mad about? What should I be outraged about? Um, you know, what are what are they doing? They're out to get me. How you know who, <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, and so you you pay attention to them, um, and and it's really just a part of this agenda setting war that's been going on now for decades. I, I'm always interested when they use Chicago as a place that is so <laughs> violent and dangerous. Look at Chicago, they say, you know? And and it, and it kind of keeps coming back. And like half of these people have never even been to Chicago. I mean, there's never a representative of Chicago being given the opportunity to talk about what they're doing there. It's just used as this kind of place that you never want to go to. I mean, Chicago's one of the greatest cities in America. But that, is, but that aside, it's like the, the, the faux outrage means that people are getting worked up about places that they've never been to, about uh, race wars that they'll never experience because they live in predominantly white areas or whatever. You know, they, they just, they don't see that America out of their window. They just see it through that, that kind of screen on their, hanging on their wall. I mean... It's a, it's, it, it is the parallel universe. It is not it is. reality. And yet the Trump supporter who I am quite close to, who's my, my landlord, and I try so hard to kind of, you know, do, I do my best and I, I fail. You know, I have a good command of the English language. I, he calls me that BBC guy, tells people I work for the BBC because <laughs> he thinks the BBC is biased. I mean, I used to work for the BBC, but he doesn't care. You know, it's like he he has branded me as that. And he says, I tell my friends, I, I rent one of my places to a BBC guy. And why would I do that? And it and it's because, you know, the BBC has obviously said true stuff about Trump and it doesn't work for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, the media cultivates reality for all of us. Um, right, whether you're on the left or the right, whether you're exposing yourself to good information or bad information. Um, for people who have been a part of that media ecosystem for decades at this point, they don't know the difference um, between good information and bad information. There's a history that they've been a part of now, you know, so it, 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 it all makes sense to them. Um, and so there's a, a complete narrative, right, that says that and playing people... along is kind of fun, though, isn't it? For them? That, that's <laughs> like the that's the, the cult. That's the 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 Amway or the Scientology or, you know, whatever that group is where you feel safe. That's right. They feel safe if they play along with the rhetoric. Well, I mean, to say it that way makes it seem as though they are being duplicitous in some way. And I think that these folks earnestly believe that the nation is threatened and that people like you and me are to blame. Um, right. They, they, they earnestly believe that. Um, and I don't think that it's their fault that they believe it. That's the news that they're exposed to. That's reality to them. And it's so foreign to us because we're not a part of that reality. Um, you know, I, I, had this experience with my dad where you know he and I um, always talk about current events. Um, that's always been our thing. I used to watch the news with him when I was little, probably why I became interested in politics um, and American democracy, you know, as an adult. And, um, you know, it's just how we bond. And my mom was sick a few years ago and my dad and I were going back and forth to the hospital and we could not find any current events that we knew about in the same way. And this was over several days. And he would say, well, you heard about so-and-so and what they did. And I'd be like, no, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that happened. And I'd be like, well, did you hear? And he'd be like, no, no. And, you know, and, it, and it, we just didn't know anything. So we couldn't even talk about, about what, you know, a, a neutral thing. Um, and, and then this will tell you where, um, where, what time it was. There were two things that we knew 
in the same way. We knew the same information. One is that there are more spiders on the planet than there are people. And the other one was uh, that uh, Scaramucci guy. Uh, we both knew that Scaramucci had a potty mouth. <laughs> and those were the only facts that we both knew and that we could really talk about. Um, and for me, that was really sad. It was really eye opening, of course, but it was really, um, it was really hard because, you know, I, I love my dad and I don't talk about sports. I don't know what else to talk about with him. <laughs> you know, my, my, my dad was the same and I, I had to deal with, you know, he was very much on the right, you know, really very much on the right. And he couldn't understand my desire to kind of want everyone to be treated equally just couldn't get his head around it and and you know yeah. to the day to the day he died um it's this it's this kind of barometer for reality that i am so fascinated in you know you and i have a natural barometer for reality we 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 are well read enough i mean i'm not particularly educated but i have grown up in an environment where i can tell good from bad right from wrong true from false so many people in the United States do not have that inbuilt barometer. And so they are ripe for radicalization. Well, you know, propaganda, manipulation strategies, the dark arts of communication, they all work on taking advantage of our vulnerabilities. Our human beings have cognitive weaknesses, we have emotional weaknesses, and we have social weaknesses that make us vulnerable. Um, and we all want to identify with a group. That's the social weakness that we have. And so we tend towards groupthink. We tend to like the things that people in our group, however that's constituted, we like what they do. Um, if somebody in the out group does the same thing, we are far more uh, censorous and vicious about, you know, how we think about it. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that are just naturally and innately human, right? About how we process information, about how our emotions work and about how we affiliate with others that make us, um, you know, sort of weak to these kinds of manipulation strategies. And unfortunately, the more research we do about how those manipulation strategies work, the more they're used against us. The, I don't watch any cable news other than Fox, and I watch <laughs> Fox because I feel like I need to know how people are, are you know, being being fed this uh, this material. The outrage in the last couple of weeks about Trump dining with the far right Nick Fuentes and and Kanye West. I mean, the, the cable channels and even CNN and MSNBC, they were just, listen, this is all they talked about. Mm -hmm. And I, I put out a tweet at the very beginning that said, I do not understand the outrage about this dinner because it's widely known that Trump is a white supremacist. It's, it's been known for decades. I mean, why, the, why is the media treating it as a scandal when nothing has changed? It's a good question. Because the media needs to make a profit, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's my, the point I'm getting to is that will America ever be able to police itself from future fascist uprisings or, or the, the fall of democracy or January 6th on another day if the media that should be holding uh, politicians to account is in it for profit. It, there there yeah. will never be that opportunity to, because in the UK, journalism is, is, is there to bring balance. It's, it's part of the democracy. The unwritten constitution in the UK involves journalists. Here it's, it's like, it's advertising, it's capitalism, it's sales, it's, the whole thing on every channel, even the left-wing channels, it's just a business. It is a business. Uh, one of the professors I studied under while I was getting my PhD is Bob McChesney. And he wrote a book in 1999 while I was in grad school called Rich, Me Rich Media, Poor Democracy. Uh, you probably have read it. And, um, and he was absolutely right. Um, <laughs> For-profit media does a disservice to democracy. Um, and it's an institutional problem. 
Uh, my experience with most reporters is that they are very pro-democracy and they want to find out the truth and tell it to people, hold people accountable um, in power and make the world a better place. But they're working within an institution that is profit driven um, and it's only become more profit driven over the last 30 years. Uh, you know, before it was sort of thought to be a public service, um, you know, and news divisions didn't need to make money. Uh, that's completely changed. And, you know, we saw a bunch of people get fired from news jobs this week. And, and that's all about pleasing um, shareholders and, and not at all about, you know, holding people in power accountable. But you can do both. I mean, that's the thing. You don't have to go back to the days of the fairness doctrine to kind of have, you know, balance. You, you, you can tell the truth and still make a profit. And yet it's kind of, it's like ambulance chasing, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it really is the very lowest form of journalism. It's barely journalism. It's kind of infotainment. It is and, infotainment. And, and America deserves better, surely. Absolutely. And I have to tell you, you know, I had a conversation with some of my journalism colleagues this week about the Kanye West, um, Nick Fuentes, Trump dinner story. And I said, you know, how would you tell your students about how to cover this? I mean, there are no reliable narrators among them. Who are you going to interview to get this story? And, um, you know, and they said, oh, well, we would tell our students to just report the facts. So, OK, so the fact is they had dinner and then there's no story after that. Right. And they're like, right, that's all. That's all we would. And I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> I yeah. mean, in a fantasy world, right, you could do that if you were a journalist. But, you know, they want more details. They want more story. They want color. They want, you know, they want to hear from the unreliable narrators who are trying to game the system, um, you know, and and troll each other through the media. So, um, you know, I think that unfortunately the media is very weak. It's put itself in a very, very weak position um, where it's not trusted. It's, um, you know, beholden to shareholders and companies and that buy them out and cut them up and um, destroy them. And it's also at the mercy of these um, conflict entrepreneurs, as one scholar calls them, people who use the media to undermine the media and undermine democracy. Um, we're in a, a bad spot. I never, ever use the phrase fake news, even when I'm quoting Trump, because I genuinely, just because of my profession, feel that it's the most offensive of all of the kind of fascist tropes that that he used. And it's a classic one. And it's something that, you know, the Nazis made made their kind of modus operandi was just making people think, well, the press is not true and therefore don't trust them, trust us enemy of the people, all of that stuff. And, you know, there were a couple of stars during Trump's uh, um, administration. There were a couple of stars that kind of stood up to him uh, who ended up losing their, their White House um, uh, authentication. You know, they weren't allowed to, to return to the press room. You dedicated your book to... Uh, the journalists who did their best to try to hold Trump accountable for his words and actions. I did. Um, were there enough of them? And and you know who were you thinking about when you when you made that dedication in the front of your book? Yeah, I was thinking about. I read a lot of transcripts where I could. You know, if if there were. Um, so of course I had to transcribe all of Trump's rallies. And so I heard all of the threats and insults um, that were made against reporters. But I also read a lot of transcripts and interviews that Trump did with reporters, um, things that didn't make it into newsprint, um, that didn't make it onto the air. And um, I don't know, you, uh, you probably would appreciate the concept of a political spectacle, right? Which is that... Uh, a news event, an interview, is something that is created. It, it It's not natural. It doesn't exist in the world. <laughs> but people yeah. agree to, you know, sort of understandings of what's going to happen. Um, you know, the reporter... It requires gets, consent. 
Yeah, the, the reporter asks questions, the politician gives answers, um, you know, and, and they might vary in terms of truthfulness and, you know, but, you know, that's the sort of common ground of the scenario that <laughs> that people think they're involved in when they do a political interview. But Donald Trump wouldn't do that. Donald Trump would attack the reporter for asking the question in the first place because his goal was to show how phony it was. If he could show how phony the spectacle is, then he could control it, right? He could attack it and he could he could make it seem like he was authentic and real and that they were liars. Um, and in so doing, he also provided himself with immunity, right, from any bad news, critical information that might emerge. So he didn't play by the rules of the game. Um, and he didn't play by the rules of any of the games <laughs> that, you know, he was a part of and he still doesn't. Um, and so I saw a lot of reporters just trying to do their job, just trying to ask him questions, trying to ask follow up questions, getting insulted, told they were um, especially women, um, you know, being told that they were just little girls, um, you know, that they shouldn't even have this job. How dare they? Um, you know, he, he was very, very willing to just attack a person directly for trying to do their I was, job. I was thinking how the rise of Trump would have been facilitated in other countries other than the US. So let's just pretend that Trump became the prime minister of the UK, for example. The press, as I know it, because I was part of it, would have laughed him off of the podium from the very first speech when he said, we're banning all Muslims from entering the US until we can work out what the hell is going on. He would have been so ridiculed, not just by biased press, but by all press, because it's ridiculous. And yet that thing, which was like the other thing that really stuck with me, aside from the, you know, the, the, the criticizing the media, banning all Muslims. And yet... American media didn't really do anything. I mean, I kind of felt like in the back of their minds, they were like, oh, good, we don't have to deal with the Muslims anymore. I mean, that was my fear. Is, that, is there an inherent racism or xenophobia in, in American media that they didn't jump on this and ridicule him? Uh, Liz Truss was a prime minister in the UK for two weeks recently because she was so totally crap that she was ridiculed by the people the media and this kind of, you know, it's a smaller country, so you have a kind of mood of the nation thing, which you don't really have in the US because it's too big. But she lasted two weeks. <laughs> she had to resign because we still have a thing called shame. There was no attempt to shame Donald Trump off the, the podium. Even That's if not it, true. <laughs> he cannot be shamed. They did try to shame him. Um, and it not just... I mean, from his announcement speech on, uh, if you look at the reporting of his announcement speech, he was mocked, ridiculed. It was um, it was everything that you would want them to say. They said all the things uh, right from the very beginning. But he cannot be shamed. And so, you know, if you if you read that story again, um, you'll see that. I mean, for a while, Fox News tried to control him. Right. They said that. Um, after the first primary debate where he had attacked Megyn Kelly and then stayed up all night tweeting, attacking Megyn Kelly, um, you know, they tried to sort of bring him in line and say, you need to act properly. Uh, and, and he mastered them. Like he, he, he withdrew his support. He withdrew his, um, his, his interviews, you know, and he got his supporters to attack them. And eventually they had to capitulate. Um, you know, you had the same thing with um, the conservatives. So the National Review wrote an article. They wrote a whole issue um, right before the first caucuses and primaries in January of 2016. They wrote a whole against Trump issue explaining why he could never be president. He should never be president. And you probably recall Trump saying that he could shoot someone in Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose supporters. What you don't probably remember is that the context within which he said that was reporters asking him about this National Review issue where they had said that you should never vote for this guy because he's a populist. He's not a conservative. 
And his response was to say, those people are the problem. They're as corrupt as anyone else. And by the way, it's a failing publication and no one cares what they have to say. You know what? My people, my people are strong. My support is strong. I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose supporters. They're not going to care what the National Review says. That was the context within which he said that. Um, and so he also said that if he would run for president, he would probably run as a Republican because the voters are so dumb that he could say anything and they would vote for him. I mean, and, and that yeah. that clip is very rarely shown these days. Yeah. You know, and, and yet and yet it's on it's on videotape. I mean, yeah, it, it is remarkable to me that that there is this ability for people to kind of switch their allegiance so easily to say one thing, even though it's on video, even though there's evidence, talking about the Lindsey Grahams and the Kevin McCarthy's and, you know, all of these people, even Mitch McConnell, who, you know, refused to condemn Trump for his meeting with with Kanye West, just again, used the word salad, managed to wriggle out of it and give the impression that he'd said something. And, And this kind of goes back to the media... Where I'm from, all politicians of every party give interviews to all media because they know that that's the democratic process. But here in the U.S., I've never seen Mitch McConnell be interviewed. I've never seen Kevin McCarthy be interviewed. I mean, occasionally, maybe he'll speak for 30 seconds on Fox. But an actual, like, sit-down interview with somebody who's going to grill them, there is no democracy in in. American media. It, 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 it has ceased to exist with, I don't know when, Walter Cronkite, maybe. Yeah, I, I think that it's a little bit more recent than Walter Cronkite. But yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. If people aren't willing to sit down and answer hard questions, then no one gets to hold them accountable. Um, and I really think that uh, I've traced this out, how it works with presidents and how long they've sort of been avoiding um the opposition press. And it really, um, it really became something that was easy to do once social media or or even really just the ability to have like internet communication, um, really saturated the nation. So for example, um, in 2008, when Barack Obama ran, he was able to essentially sidestep the press by posting everything on YouTube, by creating a website that his supporters could interact with his content, by using Facebook. Um, And he created this amazing database of email addresses and text messages, phone numbers for him, his supporters, where he would, instead of breaking news through, you know, the traveling press team or the White House press corps later when he got into office, he would break news directly to his supporters, um, avoiding the press. And the press were mad. (laughs) You know, they were constantly trying to get him to sort of go back to the reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationship that they had where they needed each other. Um, But once technology diffused enough through the population, presidents and presidential candidates realized that they didn't need the media. And Mm -hmm. really, the media has been incredibly weak ever since that happened. Um, And so, yeah. Obama was an anomaly, though. You know, that that will never happen again, as far as I, I, I see it. That, that to have not just a, a black man in the White House, but yeah. to have somebody who can get up on a podium and sing Amazing Grace. Just thinking about it, Jennifer, it like gives me yeah. chills. Yeah, not to say anything about Obama's rhetorical style and abilities. I mean, but just talking about the relationship between the press and the president and the way that a president or a politician does not need the media today. That changed the relationship between the news and their ability to hold people accountable. Um, We first noticed it with George W. Bush. Um, So a a co-author and I wrote about the post-rhetorical presidency um, and and about George W. Bush and how he used um, basically propaganda strategies, (laughs) flooding the zone before we had that term, Um, you know, to control the media. And what we saw with Obama, we weren't sure if the next president would do that. But what we saw with Obama is that 
He had a very different strategy. Um, he's very tight with how he let information out, very controlled about what who he talked to, um, sought out other venues, you know, that weren't traditional for news audiences. But um, but he still didn't bring back that sort of reciprocal relationship. And um, and the White House press corps was constantly fighting with him to try to get more access. And he just wouldn't give it. He was very tight with it. Um, and because he, he knew that it was a game. You know, he knew, as you described, and he with the, the interview that. process. That, yeah. yeah, it was like e- each organization needs each other. And he was bigger than that, I guess. You know, he, and he so felt is Donald that, Trump. And Donald yeah, Trump was like the able only people to that recreate. matter are the voters. I know you just yeah. don't like Donald Trump, but Donald Trump was able to do the same things. He was able yeah. to create a situation, a dynamic where everything he did was so outrageous that it attracted so much attention from the left and the right that the media had to cover him. Um, and people were fascinated. And because he was able to draw audiences, he was more powerful than the media was. Um, and and that's what I really see Kanye West doing this week is trying to use those same strategies to get a lot of media attention. Media, you know, maybe doesn't even want to cover him, um, you know, certainly not as a viable possible 2024 presidential candidate. Uh, but here we are again where the media is weak and they have to cover this story. Is this the case with people who are mentally compromised? And I hate to use the word normal because I don't believe normal is a is a kind of basis for anything. But with Kanye West, who I can clearly see in interviews, is is not the full ticket. Trump has his own pathology, different to Kanye West's. Elon Musk has pathology that is, you know, he he's ha, is has autism spectrum disorder. All of these people are showmen, you know, they they perform and they feed, they thrive off of the the feedback and the and the reaction and the applause and so they play up to it and before you know it they have got themselves into a situation yeah i you know one of the things that i say about trump is that he's essentially america's authoritarian pt barnum and right. he's really good at getting attention and using that attention to control the narrative to control what we're talking about um, if you think about the attention economy and how there are so many things that are pulling at our attention all the time, Donald Trump has been able to control our political conversation for seven years. It's amazing, um, honestly. And you have other people who have adopted those same strategies. Um, I, I don't know if they have the same goals exactly, but um, they do seem to have an affinity for one another. Uh, and all of them in one tweet <laughs> from the yeah. Republican. Well, Bolsonaro in Brazil <laughs> tried to kind yeah. of emulate Trump, didn't yeah. he? he? Tried to do a kind of copycat version, and it hasn't worked for him. Um, and you know, he he because he he lost right. ultimately. He won, but, but then he lost. Yeah, he won, <laughs> so but then Trump. he lost. <laughs> but Trump has now lost three times, and so clearly there is not the appetite for this material because in Trump's uh, announcement speech a couple of weeks ago he didn't say anything new in fact he painted America as a very grim dark place which I believe is not the America that people are beginning to realize they're living in because actually America is on the up and gas prices are going down and uh, there are more jobs and you know it is getting better COVID is on the way out I mean but but Trump wants to kind of paint a version of the U.S. that that isn't very few people's reality. Yeah, it wasn't a great announcement speech. Um, he tried to be presidential, I think, um, and he's not good at that. It was boring. Uh, like you said, there was no new information provided, um, but it was the same authoritarian P.T. Barnum, you know, content. Right. So he said essentially what you said, that, that this is a nation in crisis, everything is corrupt and bad, and I'm the only hero who can save the nation. Um, you know, very much what he has been saying to us since 2015. Um, he didn't sell it very well, and it wasn't very exciting. Um, and, and I don't think that people are excited. Um, the Republicans I've talked to are not excited to support Trump again in 2024. Um but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of people running and that works to Trump's advantage. Um, so 
I don't know what will happen. Um, but, you know, again, if you only know anything about the United States through watching Fox News and the OAN and the Newsmax, you're going to think that the world is very scary and that the United States is run down and that it's all crime and violence and no one is safe and certainly not you. Um, you know, and so Donald Trump's appeal is very much to that demographic that um, that watches that, that news programming. I just want to finish with that word that you just used, corruption, mm. because, you know, he he is corrupt in so many ways, you know, emotionally corrupt and, and, and financially corrupt. And, and in the news this week, and we're just going to touch on it, but uh, Alan Weisselberg has been in, in court over this Trump uh, organization tax fraud case. And it's now being used in the in the kind of latest kind of bombshell closing arguments. The they're saying that Trump knew exactly what was going on with these top executives who schemed for years to dodge taxes on company paid perks. I mean, Trump cheats at golf, right? So, of course, he's absolutely corrupt when it comes to paying taxes. We've got this uh, probe, the court halting the Mar-a-Lago special master review. Um, that was a unanimous federal appeals court uh, announcement on Thursday, which ended this in, this independent review of the documents that Trump wanted and got a Trump judge to kind of put in place. I mean, corruption really, it, it, wherever Trump goes, corruption follows. Now, he will call them a witch hunt and he will claim that, you know, the Southern District of New York or whoever is investigating him, it, it, it's politically motivated. Do you think there's a tipping point when people will realize that there's a gazillion court cases against Trump and, and his people and that half of his campaign team from 2016 are either in prison or wearing an electronic tag right now. Do you think there's a tipping point where the facts will come through, through whichever media it might be, and that Biden is, you know, there's, even if they investigate Biden, they will find nothing, and yet Trump still has multiple investigations against him, and especially off the back of this uh, new special counsel, is, is likely to be prosecuted? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Um, I think it depends on whether or not Rupert Murdoch continues to try to kneecap him. Um, you know, he, for the last month or so, he's been using his um, network and using his tabloids to... Um, share negative information about Trump um, and to question whether he should run. If he decides to continue to do that and he starts to spread real information to his audiences, um, then I think there's a chance, although those audiences can always abandon Fox, right? And that's the danger and the risk for him is that they can always go to the other channels where they'll hear just what they want to hear. That's the problem with confirmation bias is that it's too easy to confirm what you want to believe. Um, you know, I've always thought that this was Trump's Achilles heel. You know, he promises to be this hero. He says that he's this successful businessman. Um, you know, if if only people could hear that he, in fact, um, you know, is a scam artist, uh, you know, proven with Trump University, where he had to refund 20 million dollars, I think, to his his um, students um, and things like that, where he has actually suffered consequences and and has been found guilty. You know, I have always thought that that might separate him from these loyal followers that he has. Um, but that hasn't been the case. And, and I'm not sure if it's not that they haven't got the information or they don't believe it. One of the things that Trump argued um, very successfully in 2016 is that the conspiracy of corruption is so deep, right? It covers academia, it covers the media, it covers um, banking and finance, the court system, it's the doctors, it's the, um, you know, certainly it is anyone who's a part of the swamp and involved in um, government, right, that there's these globalists or whatever, um, you know, that that conspiracy is basically everyone except for the Trump supporters. And so you can't trust anything that any of those people say. And what Trump argued and explained to them was that because he was an insider, because he was a part of this dirty system, 
that he was the only one who could stop it. He was the only one who could fix it, right? I alone can stop it and fix it. Um, and, and he promised them that, uh, that he had been purified somehow. Um, <laughs> and in his narrative, it was essentially that he decided to take the risk and go down the escalator in Trump Tower. Um, Forgiven for his yeah. sins to, and so to, to been, kind, of, kind of religious connotation. Yes, yeah. very religious, um, yeah. you know, which really plays into the Christo nationalism <laughs> stuff. Play, it plays very well. It yeah. does play very well with his, yeah. his desired community there, his followers. But yeah, I mean, he had been purified to fight for them, is what he car- he argued repeatedly, and they believe that they believe that he's been chosen um, to defend them and to defend America, and so they're not likely to believe that anything that contradicts that is real, uh, because that's the way conspiracy works. Conspiracy is a self sealing narrative, meaning that evidence is not allowed to count against it. Okay. It's a good place to end because it's, it's almost like a cliffhanger, isn't it? You know, as this, I'll as tell this you investigation. More next time. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let's let's just see the result because you know the, 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 there is a, a bit of a deadline. You know, the end yeah. of the year is pretty much the deadline, and so this new um, special prosecutor has uh, got his work cut There's out. There's some hope. There is some there hope is, for, for people yeah. who have ears to hear it, right? If they want to yes. learn the truth about Trump, then there's some hope that they will learn it. It's the reaction I'm most interested in from, <laughs> from his people. So yeah. that's uh, what we'll, we'll hold our breath for. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, just tell us the name of your book again so people can uh, order themselves a copy. It's called Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer Machia. My pleasure. I'm, I'm Anthony Davis. Uh, a reminder to visit hover.com slash weekend to get 10% off your bespoke domain name, either for yourself or create one for a friend. That's hover.com slash weekend. And please do subscribe to The Weekend Show and uh, on YouTube or as an audio podcast and the 5 Minute News daily podcast, which drops every morning. So you can hear me tell you the day's news while you make your coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on The 5 Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.